Today we're going to start our final unit on simple harmonic motion and waves. The first couple of days we'll talk simply about simple harmonic motion and then we'll transition into waves, like water waves, sound waves, and so on. And we'll see what the relationship between simple harmonic motion and waves is. So what is simple harmonic motion exactly? What is simple harmonic motion? Well, by definition, it's not very complicated. It's simple. What's harmonic motion? Oscillatory motion. What does that mean? Well, generally, we say that simple harmonic motion is motion that repeats itself. If we have a, uh, a set of keys on the end of a string, and we let the keys go, and it swings back and forth, we say that's simple harmonic motion. It's motion that repeats itself. If we have an object on the end of a spring, and we pull the spring back, and then we let it go, and it goes back and forth, bobs back and forth like this. Okay, that's motion that repeats itself. That's simple harmonic motion or oscillatory motion. That's how we think of simple harmonic motion. That's how we define it in our heads because that's how we see it. That's how we see simple harmonic motion. But that's not how we really define it. Simple harmonic motion is technically defined as motion in which the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement. Now, that might not make a lot of sense to you right now, but it will in a second. Okay, when I pull back a spring, okay, we pull it back just a little bit, we know that we have to apply a certain amount of force. Well, that spring will pull back on my hand with the same force, right? If I pull on a spring with five newtons, the spring pulls back with five newtons. If I pull on it with 10, the spring pulls back with 10. The force that I pull with, that's the applied force. The force that the spring pulls back wants to take it back to where it came from, that's the restoring force. Simple harmonic motion is motion in which that restoring force is directly related to the displacement. In other words, as you stretch it more, the force becomes bigger. As the displacement is bigger, the force becomes bigger. Pull a spring back. You ever pull a spring back or an elastic back just a centimeter or so and find, oh, this is easy. But the further and further and further you pull it back, harder and harder it is to stretch. You ever notice that? You ever go to a Flames game and see that, that human bowling thing that they do sometimes? You ever see that? All right, so we just watched that video of, uh, of the uh, Flames game where they do the, uh, the human bowling. They pull back that elastic, okay, that bungee cord. The further they stretch it, the more and more and more they stretch it, the harder and harder and harder they have to pull. That is simple harmonic motion. Motion in which the force gets bigger as the displacement gets bigger. Okay? That's kind of a little bit hard to see on a day-to-day -day basis, so kind of a little bit hard to, to, to visualize when the force gets bigger as the displacement gets bigger, at least sometimes. So how does that manifest itself? Well, it usually manifests itself as motion that's repeating itself, back and forth, to and fro motion. Why does the motion repeat itself? Why, when the restoring force is proportional to the displacement, does the motion repeat itself? Well, if this is our equilibrium position, this is our position where the spring or the elastic is not stretched or not compressed, and you stretch it out this way, the force becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Then you let it go. So what happens? Well, as the force acts this way, and it's really, really big by this point, then what happens? The object starts moving this way. So it's moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. But the force starts becoming smaller because the displacement becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it reaches this point where the displacement is zero. No force. But it keeps moving because it had inertia. Now the force is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It slows down. What happens? Now it kicks it back this way. The force becomes smaller, but the speed becomes bigger reaches its maximum speed, force becomes bigger, 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 bigger. It stops and goes back and keeps repeating itself. All because as you get further away from this equilibrium position right here, the force keeps getting bigger and bigger, pulling it back to the equilibrium position. Does that make sense? All right, what are some examples of simple harmonic motion? Well, we talked about a couple already, right? The spring. The elastic, when we stretch a spring or stretch an elastic, and we let that spring or the elastic go, it's going to vibrate back and forth, to and fro motion, back and forth motion, motion that repeats itself. 
because the restoring force is directly proportional to the, to the displacement. What's another example? The pendulum. The pendulum is the swing set. It's the keys on the end of the string. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We're going to start this one, actually, because this isn't true simple harmonic motion. It's not motion in which the restoring force is perfectly proportional to the force, to the displacement, but it's real close. Close enough that we're going to consider it to be simple harmonic motion. Well, if we're talking about motion that repeats itself, motion that cycles, then we have to talk about a couple terms that we talked about in our last unit, frequency and period. The frequency in the last unit was the number of revolutions per second. In this unit, we're going to say it's the number of not revolutions, because we're not talking about circles, but just the number of cycles per second. The number of cycles per unit time. We can find the frequency by saying the number of cycles over the time. In the last unit, we said it was the number of revolutions over the time. The unit for frequency, by the way, would be hertz, same as it was in the last unit. The period, well, in our last unit, it was the time for one revolution. This time, it's going to be the time for, the time for one cycle, one complete cycle. We're going to say big T is equal to the time divided by the number of cycles. Now, what do we mean by one cycle? If I take my keys up and I let them go, and they act as a pendulum going back and forth here, is this one cycle? Or is this one cycle? The back and forth motion is one cycle. So we're talking about from one spot back to that spot. That's the cycle. Okay? If I want to find the period of a pendulum, and you're going to have to do that, by the way, on Friday in your field trip, find the period of a pendulum. Okay, what you want to do is measure the time that it takes to go from here back to here, not the time that it takes to go to halfway. That's half the period. Make sense? The time for one complete cycle, and a cycle repeats itself. So we're not going halfway through. We're going right back to where we started. If we're talking about the spring, okay, if we start right here, with the spring stretched right here, it goes back and forth. That's the time for one complete cycle, not halfway across right there. All right, what's the relationship between these two? Talked about this in the last unit. The frequency is what? Also, we really give an answer there. 1 over t. 1 over t. Okay, these are not on your data sheet, although you can use them. This is on your data sheet right there. All right, the first question we're going to do is pretty easy, actually, because we've pretty much done it already in our last unit in circular motion. What's the, what's the frequency of an automobile engine in which the pistons oscillate with a period of 0 0.0625 seconds? That's the period, right? We want to find the frequency? Simply 1 over t. 1 over 0 0.0625 seconds. Do that on a calculator. A couple of ways, by the way, that we can do that on a calculator. Okay, you can go 1 divided by 0 0.0625, and when we do that, we get 16. There's actually a bit of a quicker way, though. Has anybody ever, anybody ever tried this on the calculator? Um, 0 0.0625x to the minus 1. You ever seen that? That goes 1 over that number, and we get 16. So the frequency here would be 16 hertz. Okay? 16 cycles per second. Pretty straightforward, I think. Let's try a couple quick, couple quick questions on 345. Give you one or two minutes to finish those up, and then we'll see uh, where we can go from this. No troubles with these questions? OK. This is part of our simple harmonic motion section, but this is the part that's really important for our field trip on Friday, because there's one of the rides that you're going to have to uh, measure some of, the, some of the properties of a pendulum and be able to do some calculations involving that pendulum. So what's a pendulum? 
Well, it's a device that consists of a string, we'll call it a bob. We're being discriminatory towards bobs right now, but we'll, we'll survive. We'll get by. We'll get over it. It's a string with a bob on the end of it, a set of keys on the end of it, or a swing on the end of it, or a whatever on the end of it. We call it a bob that swings back and forth. We said a minute ago that that's not truly simple harmonic motion, but it's really, really close for relatively small angles. So when you're under 40 degrees or so, it's a really good approximation of simple harmonic motion. Above that, okay, if you're at 67 degrees, it's not so good anymore. Okay, but most times when you see a pendulum going back and forth like this, most times you're under an angle of 40, 45 degrees. So the approximation, the simple harmonic motion approximation works just fine. The period of the pendulum is the time that it takes the pendulum to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, not the time that it takes to go back or forth, but rather back and forth. From start back to where it started. The period of the pendulum. Now, what do you think the period of the pendulum is dependent upon? What do you think affects how long it takes the pendulum to go back and forth? Give me some, give me some, some hypotheses here. Give me a guess as to what you think might affect how long it takes this pendulum to go back and forth. I don't care if you're right or not. I just want to, I just want to guess. You going? Well, the number of cycles per unit of time, yes, but that's a direct mathematical relationship, right? What properties of this pendulum, when you look at this pendulum right now in my hand, what properties of this pendulum could I change that would change how long it takes to swing back and forth? What's one? Okay, the length of the string. So let's, don't write this down quite yet, okay, because we're going to test these in just a second. So let's say the length of the string, we'll call that L. Seems logical that if you change the length of the string, then you would change the period of the pendulum, how long it takes to go back and forth. But we'll test that in a moment here. Kevin? The mass on the end of it, or the mass of the string itself? Okay, the mass, or so the mass of the bob? We'll say the mass of bob. We could have called that little m. Okay, that seems logical as well, right? If you have something that's really, really heavy, it's probably going to go a little bit faster, right, than something that's really, really light, and therefore its period will be, slow, will be uh, quicker. Yeah. Okay, so the the displacement of it or the angle. Let's say the initial angle. Okay, so in other words, if I let it go, if I let it go from 10 degrees like this versus 30 degrees like this, that's going to affect the period of the pendulum. Uh, that definitely seems logical, right? Uh, stands to reason that if I let it go from here, it's going to take longer than if I let it go from here, right? Any others? Well, let me tell you one thing that definitely does affect the period of the pendulum. One thing that we can't test. That's gravity. The period of the pendulum on Earth is different than the period of the pendulum on the moon. The period of the pendulum, in fact, in Vancouver, is different than the period of the pendulum on the top of Mount Everest. A clock that works via a pendulum like a grandfather clock should actually be calibrated to your altitude. If you move a grandfather clock from Vancouver to Calgary, which is a difference in altitude of about a kilometer or so, then the period of that bob that swings back and forth will actually be slightly different because gravity is slightly weaker in Calgary than it is in Vancouver. So it would have to be calibrated. Okay, the gravity matters. That's a good question. It wouldn't, it, it's not going to be a huge effect when you're talking about one kilometer difference in altitude, but it's still going to be an effect. Okay, now, are you going to notice it over a period of 10 minutes? No. Are you going to notice it over a period of a couple of years? Yeah, you probably would. So I guess it depends upon how accurate you want to be with your time, right? If you don't mind resetting your clock every, every year or so, it's okay. If you want to keep it as accurate as possible, then you're going to want to calibrate it. Okay, so we know this one is a factor. We know this one definitely affects it. 
What about the length of the string? Let's test that one right now, okay? We'll just do a little qualitative thing, okay? I'm going to swing my keys back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I want you to time in your head. You don't even need to take your stopwatch out. Start, stop. Start, stop. You can get a sense in your head for how long that took versus start, stop. Start, stop. You can tell that one is quicker than the other. Okay, that's what I want you to do right now. Just see which one is quicker, if there is a difference. Okay? The length of the string. So right now we've got a string that is, well, the entire length of this string. Okay? Listen very carefully, okay? I'm going to bring this up to about 45 degrees. I'm going to let it go. Start, stop. Start, stop. Start, stop. You got that time? Let's reduce the length of it. Remember we had start, stop. Let's reduce the length of it to about half. Start, stop. Start, stop. Start, stop. Was the period the same? Was it quicker or slower? It's quicker, right? So the length of the string does matter as well. So how could you calibrate something like a grandfather clock by taking it to a different altitude? Effectively change the length of it, right? By the slightest little amount to change the period of it. So basically, gravity has one effect. You want to adjust the length of it so it has the opposite effect. The mass of the bob at the end. Well, you know, let's do the angle here right now. Let's do the angle. Okay, let's start with a really small angle, like let's say about 10 degrees, and then we'll go to about 45 degrees. Got it? Okay, starting at 10 degrees. Actually, we'll do the 45 because we've already done that one. Start, stop. Start, stop. Start, stop. 45 degrees, right? Start, stop. Let's do 10 degrees. Start, stop. Start, stop. 45, start, stop. 10 degrees, start, stop. Did the angle matter? No, it didn't. The angle doesn't have any effect. Why not? Boy, it seems so logical. That seemed like the obvious one that would have an effect. But yet it doesn't have an effect. Happy, why doesn't it have an effect? Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly right. The speed. Listen, when it's going this far, it doesn't have nearly as far to go, right, when it's a small angle. But it's going a lot sm slower. When it has a bigger angle, it's got a lot further to go, but it's moving a lot faster, right? So in the end, it ends up taking the same amount of time either way. So the, the initial angle of the pendulum doesn't matter. What about the mass on the end of it? Okay, I got one set of keys on the end of it right now. 45 degrees. Start, stop. Start, stop. Let's put another set of keys on the end of it so the mass is effectively twice as much. Remember it was start, stop. Twice the mass now. Same angle. Start, stop. Start, stop. Does it make a difference? James? No. The mass didn't matter either. Well, boy, it sure seemed like that one would have an effect as well. But it doesn't. We know it doesn't because if I drop something that's really light versus something that's really heavy and it goes straight down, it's going to accelerate at the same rate. Why wouldn't it go in that curve at the same rate as well? It doesn't matter how heavy it is. So what's our equation? Our equation depends only on gravity and the length of string. The period of the pendulum is given by the equation 2 pi, 2 pi, so that's a constant, right? 6.28, 2 pi times the square root of L, that's the length of the string, divided by G, that's 9.81 on the surface of the Earth, or at least in the average location of the surface of the Earth. T is equal to 2 pi square root L over G. That's a pretty easy equation to solve, unless we're trying to rearrange to solve for L or G. Let's go through that process right now and re of rearranging this equation. Remember, we start out with two is equal to, t is equal to 2 pi square root L over G. Let's solve for L. Well, if we're solving for L, we're going to take the 2 pi over by dividing. Make sense? T is, 2 pi is multiplied by that. Let's take it over by dividing. Now let's take the square root over by squaring. It becomes 
t over 2 pi squared equals L over G. Now let's take the G over by multiplying. That's kind of ugly. The length of the string is equal to G times brackets two, T over 2 pi and brackets squared. What if we wanted to find a little G? Well, do what you just did to get to get L. So we'll start there. L is equal to G times T over 2 pi. Now we got to take the T over 2 pi squared over by dividing. It becomes L over T over 2 pi brackets squared. So these are the three forms of the equation that you're going to have to be able to use. This one appears on your data sheet. You've got to be able to figure out this one and this one. All right? One quick example, 7.8 on 379, says, what's the field strength of the top of Mount Everest at an altitude of 89.54 meters if the pendulum with a length of one meter has a period of 2.01 seconds? So we're looking for the field strength. We're looking for G. Uh, L is 1.00 meters. T is 2.01 seconds. Uh, the altitude doesn't matter. Okay? The altitude is going to affect what the value of G is but it's not going to affect us in our calculation of, uh, of little g here and using the pendulum. Let's say t is equal to 2 pi squared L over g. Let's take the uh, 2 pi over by dividing. Let's take the square, over by, square root over by squaring. Let's take the g up by multiplying. And now let's take the t over 2 pi squared over by dividing. So we've got a length of this pendulum of 1 meter. We've got a time of 2.01 seconds over 2 pi brackets. Let's do this on our calculator. Make sure you follow along so you can do this yourselves, OK? Let's say. Let's get the number on the bottom first. 2.01 divided by brackets 2 times pi, end brackets. Okay, that's the number on the bottom. Let's square that number on the bottom. And then let's flip that over. 1 divided by that number gives me 9.77 meters per second squared. So here we are at Calgary, somewhere around 9.8 or so. What are we at top of Mount Everest? 9.77. Is there a difference? Yeah. Is it measurable? Yes. Is it significant? No. But it's different. Make sense? Your homework questions? Practice problems that go with this on page 379. Three questions on page 379. That's it for today.